Dear colleagues, uh, dear Raymond, it is my great privilege to be able to contribute to this conference. Uh, once again, I would like to warmly thank you, uh, my dear colleague and friend uh, Raymond, for your uh, kind, very kind invitation. I'm so sorry uh, to be unable to, to be with you in person. Uh, this is due to some important institutional commitments here in Brussels because uh, in particular of the first anniversary of the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. I have uh, five main messages to share with you today. The first one relates to the current compliance status of the covered entities with the GDPR. And with the first anniversary of the GDPR coming tomorrow, it is time to look back upon our achievements and to also ask uh, ourselves some questions about the future. As you know, today 134 countries in the world have now their own privacy law and mostly follow similar principles compared to the, to the GDPR. Worldwide, there are still uh, competing models. For example, China and possibly US, where they are now intensively debating uh, the chance for a federal privacy law. And just yesterday, the city of San Francisco became the first one to ban facial recognition on ground of protecting democracy and human dignity. Plenty of studies show companies were not fully ready for May 25th last year implementation date. And therefore, accordingly, <coughs> to one of those studies, it seems that 40% uh, of uh, the respondents said they would be GDPR compliant after the 15th of May last year. Today, organizations should already have at least most of the structures for compliance with GDPR in, uh, in place. First of all, uh, a meaningful and extensive mapping of their processing activities. Second, a clear picture of the main risks arising when they're processing personal data. Third, the ability to respond to data subject access requests. And finally, uh, many other things. Uh, what, what about today? Is this actually happening? Um, let me say that it is uh, honestly difficult to draw up clear updated estimates on the overall compliance uh, with the GDPR and for many reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, it is a law with a very broad scope of application which embraces the activities of companies and organizations that operate uh, throughout the world. Secondly, it has been designed to operate over the long term and after all, after almost uh, thousands of amendments and four years of discussions by the European Union uh, co-legislators, it could not be, it could have not been uh, otherwise. And <coughs> let me also say that for obvious reasons, uh, companies <coughs> tend uh, not to share their compliance status with us. In any case, I believe that the GDPR trend is positive. More and more entities have now a plan to achieve demonstrable uh, compliance and uh, are thus making significant progress on data protection. So GDPR is not now a buzzword, but it's a reality. And this is demonstrated uh, in my viewpoint uh, by different statistics. Uh, first of all, the increased number of appointed DPOs. Second, uh, the increased number in-house trainings organized by controllers but also by the high number of data breaches notified for control to data protection authorities by controllers. And last but not least, the uh, evident uh, increased awareness from the public. So even though, as I said, it is not easy to provide uh, precise numbers of, or percentages of such a complex uh, processes, I think that all the factors mentioned show increasing level of compliance. 
I told you I have uh, five uh, messages to share with you. Uh, the second one relate to uh, one other important point. But on all these, uh, let me be a little bit pro provocative. What does it mean being compliant under the GDPR? And this relates to my third message to you today, which relates to prevailing issues or challenges that hinder compliance. During the first period of application of the European GDPR, we have seen uh, a sort of a compliance schizophrenia trend and therefore millions and millions of emails have literally bombarded the mailboxes of all citizens all over the world in the unsuccessful attempt to demonstrate uh, that the uh, paragraph shift brought by the GDPR was starting to bear fruit. But as I repeatedly pointed out, most of those emails were simply useless. Most of privacy notices, um, often in a, a very obscure or legalese language, were clearly oriented to preserve data controllers, prerogatives and not to protect citizens. Uh, updating privacy notices by simply refreshing consent is not what GDPR is about. Being compliant is not a box ticking exercise. Each, co each controller uh, needs a strategy for building and maintaining itself as uh, a self-sustaining data protection home which uh, collects and uses personal data efficiently without a sort of a data pollution and by taking into account the surrounding ecosystem. So companies are moving towards enhanced compliance and uh, they're getting familiar with new institutes, uh, such as, for instance, data portability. Some innovations, uh, such as the need to properly internalize the accountability principle and also the risk-based approach, briefly explain why in some cases, you need uh, time to be 100% compliant. So controllers, especially the big ones, must do sort of uh, extra efforts by providing terms and conditions and use the excellence in IT developments on privacy, for example, to share information in a better, plain and communicative uh, uh, language. So GDPR remains a big opportunity for organizations of all kinds uh, to have a seal or quality for how they handle uh, all personal data. And because after all, businesses will be more successful uh, if they embrace the new culture of data protection, it is truly important not to respect simply the letter, but also the spirit of the GDPR. I promise to be short and I go quickly to my fourth message, which relates to the importance of trust and respecting data protection. In my view, the, aim, the GDPR um, succeed in restoring uh, sort of a climate of trust necessary to ensure that citizens feel protected when they surf the internet, when they open an application, when they share the information, and users should uh, have more information and control over how they, uh, their data is used. And because control over personal data can lead uh, to control over human beings, we have uh, now a perspective. So the, the, the GDPR has put the individual and his rights at the core of processing activities. Something similar what happened with classic humanism. Maine is no longer an enemy, an adversary to be deceived with a thousand ingenious tricks, but another man to understand and help. So this concept may be applied to data processing as well, uh, not as a moral speculation, but as an important part of our practical lives. Therefore, looking back over the last year, uh, rather than uh, making sure 
if a certain privacy notice uh, has been uh, updated, we need to ask ourselves if and how GDPR and other similar laws in the world actually influence what happens in the digital environment with respect particularly to the rights and freedoms of citizens. On this, allow me to say that there is still a long way to go. One aim of the GDPR, as I said, was to redress the imbalance of power between, between tech giants big tech giants and consumers to make them more accountable for how they use the data. But the current uh, ecosystem, the digital one, is still based on uh, the intensive and sometimes indiscriminate misuse of information and personal data. As the neuroscientists have already studied, these companies are exploiting us. They are making us dependent because they know how you will interact with your devices. Is this respecting our dignity? Uh, that's a question for you. Uh, let me say furthermore that in the last decade, the market structure has been converging towards uh, quasi-monopoly situations, uh, decreeing the exponential growth of the market power of a few very powerful private players. And the result is the concentration, increased concentration of the control power of information flows in the hands of tech giants. And this is a circumstance uh, that facilitates the consolidation of uh, a business model based on profiling and even the manipulation of people. In this regard, I think a structural rethinking of the prevailing business model remains necessary and possibly via coordinated intervention of the data protection, consumer protection and competition authorities may, may help. So to make all this happen, DPAs are crucial. This uh, leads to my final message which is linked to the role of data protection authorities in establishing around the world more trust between businesses, the government and data subjects. In Europe, European data protection authorities, now under also the umbrella of the newly established European Data Protection Board, have been working to establish more trust between controllers, uh, be it government or business, and data subjects in different ways by preparing, for instance, the GDPR, by raising awareness, by clarifying how the law has to be applied in practice via guidelines, and finally, by enhancing transparency. Most, if not all, uh, DPAs have set out a GDPR compliance strategy, documentation models, DPIA's tools, and now they are working, for instance, on certification. As expected, we have also seen the first round of sanctions against organization, and many will come uh, this summer and in autumn, as announced uh, by uh, some DBAs, for instance, by the Irish one. Let me say here that sanctions are, of course, important, but cannot be expected to fully prevent uh, systemic abuses of personal data. It seems that the application of fines is the only way to achieve compliance. But it's time, in my view, to think about other powers of data protection authorities to stop in a different way unlawful processing of personal data and the other uh, investigative powers uh, may be useful as well. So the debate uh, on whether uh, to use the carrot or the stick in ensuring compliance uh, continues. The real mission of data protection authorities around the world is to persuade organizations to be more accountable. And this is why the DPA of uh, EU institutions and bodies, me, uh, will look at us uh, and, and hopefully uh, the stakeholders look at us uh, by using a metaphor from the domain or architecture we would like to establish a bridge. 
and we would like uh, that this bridge will be a Renzo Piano Bridge. Such a bridge should be well integrated with the, the ecosystems of stakeholders and enable a smooth transition from policy initiatives under the, uh, until the transposition and operational phase at uh, the exit of gate, where the main streets uh, bifurcates into the many streets of regional and national laws. This is now time uh, for uh, short conclusions, um, which is simply the following. It is clear to me that the data protection culture in the light of the increasingly modernized and impactful data processing, um, allowing potentially new combinations of data and profiling requires at least uh, legislative conditions, practical and theoretical guidance by DPAs, a responsible approach by organizations which pays attention uh, to the spirit of data protection uh, principles, and finally, in a broader perspective, a wide multidisciplinary approach, embracing consumers and data protection policies as well as antitrust. Uh, so in conclusion, dear Raymond, uh, dear uh, friends, thank you very much for listening, for your attention, my uh, very best wishes from Brussels, let me uh, wish you a fruitful and inspiring discussion.